In the previous video, we talked about the structure of DNA which was given by Watson and Gray. Now we are talking about the two rules that is base pair rule and Chalgaff's rule and then we will take various types of DNAs. So base pair rule tells us that purines pair with pyrimidines. Purines pair with pyrimidines. And this is the thing which is going to help us identify or know the sequence of the DNA strand by knowing the sequence of one strand. We will see that in a minute. And the purines in case of DNA are A and G and in case of pyrimidines out of three that is C, T and U. The two pyrimidines which are found here are C and T. T will get replaced by U when we come to the structure of RNA. So in RNAs, T is not there. Instead of T, there is going to be U. And the pairing is A pairs with T by formation of two hydrogen bonds and C pairs with G by formation of three hydrogen bonds. Now this is fixed and that is why it is known as base pair rule. The rule with which these nitrogen bases they pair with each other. Now to understand this how this thing is going to help us is say we write the sequence of nitrogen bases on one strand. This is fifth prime third prime. Say it is A, T, C, G. What is going to be the sequence of nitrogen bases on the other strand? The other strand is going to be anti-parallel so this will have the third carbon free and fifth here. A always pairs with T so it has to have T on the other strand. In front of T it's going to be A, in front of C G and in front of G C. Two hydrogen bonds, two hydrogen bonds, three here and three here. So the two strands they are complementary to each other. And why are they complementary to each other? Because if you know the sequence on one, you automatically know the sequence of the other strand also. And that is because of this base pair rule which these nitrogen bases follow when they are pairing. Using the same information, Chargaff also put forth certain rules. So this is base pair and now let us talk of Chargaff's roots. Chargaff said that A that is adenine and T are equal. Are equal. We represent it as A is equal to T. This sign is, is equal to sign and here this is representing two hydrogen bonds. So we should not get confused here. So here we are saying that A pairs with T by formation of two hydrogen bonds and here we are talking about the number of A is equal to number of T. Let us take the same example. Here how many A's are there? One and two. So say there are two A's in a DNA strand and this rule is applicable only when the DNA is taken as a double stranded molecule. This is not applicable for any single standard structure. So here A's are 2 and T's are also 2. So these are 2 A's and these are 2 T's. So A is always equal to T. Why is it e uh, equal? Because we said purine is going to pair with pyrimidin. And we know A pairs with T. So this was point number 1 which was given by it. Second point was C is equal to G. Now here it is equal to sign whereas when they pair, the pairing is with the formation of three hydrogen bonds. Let us take the example here. Let us add one more. Say there is one more C and G. It is going to pair it. So how many C's are there? One C, second C, third. So there are three C's. And how many G's would be there? One G, two and three. So obviously, 
When purines pair with pyrimidines, the number of purine pairing with the pyrimidine is going to be the same. So A and T are going to be equal, C and G are going to be equal. The same interpretation was also put forth in a slightly different manner. They said for the same thing, they said A upon T is equal to 1. Again, let us take the same numbers. There are two A's and two T's and this is going to be 1. Similarly, C upon G is also going to be 1. So, this was the interpretation which was given by Chargaff. Chargaff also said, the point, third point which was given, that the number of purines and pyrimidines is equal, which is again the same thing. So, purines is equal to pyrimidines. So, Chargaff's rule was nothing else but was the interpretation of base pair rule in a slightly different manner. But the important thing is Chargaff's rule is applicable only to a double stranded DNA. Only to DS DNA. And because of this, there are questions which are asked in the exams. Because of these two rules, we are able to reach to those answers. For example, a question says that in a given DNA strand, A is 20%. A, the amount of A in a given DNA strand is 20%. What is the percent of C? This is asked. Now we know that A pairs with T. So if this is 20%, that means out of 100, if 20 are A's, there are going to be 20 T's. So out of 100, this 40 is gone. Now what is remaining? C and G. So if there is C, it is going to pair with G. So total remaining is 60. So this will be 30 and this will be 30. And why are we able to reach to this answer? Is because of this base pair rule. And every year, in almost every competitive exam, one such simple question is asked. So if you know one, you automatically know the others. This is because of this pairing and we know they are complementary to each other, the two strands. So this is base pair rule and another type of interpretation was given by Charka. Now let us talk about the various types of DNAs. Let us now talk about the types of DNA. Types of DNA. The first classification which we are talking about is on the basis of its role. That means what is that DNA is responsible for. So on the basis of, on the basis of function we can say. We classify DNAs into two categories. One is trophic DNA and the other is genetic DNA. Trophic DNA is responsible for all activities except reproduction. So, they perform or they help in all metabolic activities of the body or organism except for reproduction. Genetic DNA is the one which gets inherited and this is the one which is responsible for the reproductive processes. In higher organisms, the differentiation is not like this. But there is an example where we can see these two types of DNAs, that is paramecia. If you remember the structure of paramecia, we make two types of or two nuclei rather. These two nuclei, one is a larger and a bean shaped nucleus and the other is the smaller nucleus. We call these nuclei as macronucleus and micronucleus. The macronucleus is responsible for all the activities of the cells. 
including the digestive process, all other metabolism and everything, but does not participate in reproduction. That means the macronucleus has trophic DNA and the micronucleus is the one which participates in the process of reproduction. When reproduction, when this paramecium has to reproduce, the macronucleus disintegrates, it slowly disappears in the cytoplasm. The smaller nucleus, it divides into two. One goes in the other half, other goes in the lower half and then the binary fission takes place. That means micronucleus is helping in the reproductive process. So this has the genetic DNA. But as we said, this is not very common in higher organisms. So the example is paramecium where we see both these trophic as well as genetic DNAs. This is on the basis of the function. Now the next classification is on the basis of the number of base pairs that DNA strand has in one turn and the type of coiling. So this is on the basis of number of base pairs per turn and coiling. Let us take these different types. So DNA A, DNA B, C, D and Z. These are the five types of DNAs. So this is DNA A, B, C, D and Z. Now let us see the number of base pairs that they have. Base pairs that they have. We said that the model which was given by Watson and Crick was the B type DNA. Here the number of base pairs is 11 per turn. That means when it takes 360, one complete rotation or circle, there are 11 base pairs. The B DNA which we studied in detail has 10 base pairs per turn. C has 9.33. Now, what exactly this means? We said that if we compare it with a spiral staircase and if this is step number one, after taking one complete, if you come on the upper stair, the step, and if there are 10, then that becomes 10 base pairs. Suppose there are 11 in that one turn, that would be 11. If it is neither 10 nor 11, it is like somewhere between 9 and 10, then it is going to be 9 plus 3, 3, 9.33. And this is 8 per turn. Z has 12. So this is a special one. Then the coiling. That means whether the helix is coiled right-handed or clockwise or left-handed and anti-clockwise. This is right-handed. This is also right-handed. This is also right. This is also right. The Z one is left-handed or anti-clockwise. This is the only type of DNA which is showing left-handed coiling and maximum times the questions which are asked are on B type DNA which is the most common one and the Z type which has which is showing an exceptional thing or a different totally different thing. So here we are talking of five types of DNAs on the basis of how many base pairs they have and what type of coiling they show. It is easier to remember as we know A, B, C, D, that sequence and the number is decreasing. So 11, 10, 9.33 and 8. And Z is anyways exceptional or a different one. So that has 12 base pairs. All first four are right-handed uh, coiling uh, DNA molecules and the Z is showing left-handed coiling. So these are the two criteria on the basis of which we classify DNAs. Few important things or terms which we should know about DNAs or whenever we talk of DNA. One is known as a palindrome. So these are certain important terms we would need or discuss whenever we come in contact with anything, any topic related with DNA. 
palindromes. Palindromes are sequence of nitrogen bases on the two strands of DNA which are read the same in the same direction. This is the definition. First we will draw a palindrome and then we will see what exactly this definition means. This is one DNA strand. This is third prime and here is fifth prime. Say it has the sequence AA, TT, CG, AA, TT. What would be the sequence on the other strand? Other strand will have third prime here and fifth prime here. It will have AA here, T, T in front, okay, are we able to follow it? In front of T, it's going to be A, this is according to our base pair rule. In front of other T, it's going to be another A. In front of A, T, in front of A, T. In front of G, it's going to be C and in front of C, it's going to be G. In front of T, A, A and again T, T. Let us read it. The sequence. And we are reading this sequence on both the strands in the same direction. We can choose whichever direction we want to use. Say we go 3 to 5. A, A, T, T, C, G, A, A, T, T. A, A, T, T, C, G, A, A, T, T. So it, and again, here we are reading it in the same direction. So if you read it from third prime to five, and this also from third prime to five, the sequence of nitrogen bases is same. This is a palindrome. So now let us see the definition. Palindromes are segments of DNA in which the nitrogen base sequence is same on both the strands when they are read in the same direction. In the same direction. If we read it, the sequence is same. Then that is known as a palindrome. These palindromes are very useful when we talk of uh, biotech because when we want to transfer the insert into the host, these palindromic sequences help us giving those blunt or sticky ends. Another important thing which we need to know about DNA is denaturation, denaturation and renaturation. If DNA is treated at a higher temperature, what happens is the bonds between these nitrogen bases between A and T, double bond, double bond, double, two hydrogen bonds, here three, here three, and so on. Hydrogen bonds are weak bonds. So as soon as the temperature is increased, these are the two DNA strands, and if we heat it, increase the temperature, the hydrogen bonds between the two strands, they break, and the two DNA strands, they separate. This is known as denaturation. If you have done the PCR technique, the polymerase chain reaction, the first step that we perform is denaturation because we want to separate these two DNA strands. So by heating it, the hydrogen bonds between the two strands are broken or they get broken and the two strands get separated. If we cool this, so if this is cooled, then hydrogen bonds are formed again. So this process, that means when we are heating it, is known as denaturation. And when we are cooling it and bringing it back, then that is known as renaturation. But this is possible only if you heat it at the prescribed temperature, only for a shorter period of time. If it is heated at a very high temperature for a longer period of time, even the phosphodiester bonds will break. And if those bonds break, the DNA molecule will get totally destroyed because now you have broken that skeleton or the backbone of DNA.
One more important thing which we need to know is hyperchromatic effect. Purins and pyrimidins, they absorb UV radiations. Purins and pyrimidins absorb UV radiations. If a double-stranded DNA is exposed to UV rays, the amount of radiations absorbed are less reason. These nitrogen bases, they are paired, they are not free. But if we denature it, that means we separate it, these nitrogen bases get free. And free purins and pyrimidins would absorb more of UV radiations. So the experiment was done in which a normal DNA was taken. It was exposed to UV rays and using spectrophotometer, the value was found out. The value was something that means it absorbed some UV rays. After denaturation, the same DNA strand, when was exposed to UV rays, the value increased. And the reason why that value increased because the two strands got separated, the purins and pyrimidins, they got freed up and free purins and pyrimidins absorbed more ultraviolet radiations and in the spectrophotometer the reading which was given was more and the spectrophotometer normally gives us color reaction any particular uh, wavelength absorbed and a color reaction or color uh, indication is given so that is why it is chromatic and because this value increased after denaturation it was called hyperchromatic effect so these are certain important things which we need to remember and know about the DNA. So we have classified the DNA using various criteria. It could be function related. It could be on the basis of number of base pairs. And these are few important terms which we need to know. So about DNA, in the first part, we studied the structure which was given by Watson and Crick and every detail of it. And here we have talked about the classification also and some terms. Now in the next video, we'll start with the RNA molecules. There are three types of RNAs and we'll take all of them and their structure functions.